Hey everybody, this is Jason Wilson with Curious About Cannabis Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Uh, today I am thrilled to be able to sit down with a friend of mine and and very, very experienced um, uh, clinician and expert in Chinese medicine, uh, Dr. Jason Miller. Hey Jason, how are you today? Yeah, thanks so much for hey. being willing to carve out some time to sit down with me and see what conversations we get into about herbal medicine and cannabis and everything in between. Excited. Thanks for calling me and uh, checking in and asking me to come join your podcast. Yeah, totally. Um, so just to um, briefly describe to people um, some of the work you do, and we can get into your your kind of backstory later, but can you just very briefly describe some of the, the work you do and what your expertise is? Yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll just preface it with a little bit of um, just a little bit of background. When I graduated from medical school in traditional Chinese medicine, my f I went directly into work with uh, an expert in botanical medicine in cancer. And so I just started going into this deep study of cancer and, and chronic disease and then the application of botanical and nutritional medicine, you know, including lifestyle and diet and everything else. But um, And I went into the, the whole process of evaluating patients and taking the kind of traditional medicine approach that comes from you know, an older medical system, one that's existed for thousands of years, bringing that knowledge and wisdom through a wisdom tradition, and then digging deeply into the research of the modern science model and seeing, you know, what were the best possible solutions for a person struggling with a cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, you know, and so for 15 years, I've basically been, you know, continuing to practice Chinese medicine. I do acupuncture, I do, uh, you know, all kinds of body work in the clinic. I evaluate neurological conditions and help people with pain. Um, but I do that in a small amount of my time. Most of my time is spent either researching, um, you know, cancer, different therapies, you know, what's going on with herbs and interactions, and then just working with patients who are basically, you know, coming to me saying, hey, uh, you know, here's my situation. I don't know what to do. I've got this opinion, yeah. this opinion. And it's, and, and they're, you know, they're like, I, I need help. And so then that's where I come in and say, okay, well, let's take a look at you. Let's take a look at the ecosystem you live in. And let's take a look at what are all the possible avenues we could choose to help you get through this in a way that provides, you know, longevity and quality of life. For yeah. You. Well, and that, that segues into the first thing I wanted to talk about is, you know, when you think about the role that medicinal plants have in healthcare and medicine and just overall lifestyle wellness, um, What's your sort of approach and philosophy there? How do you see all of that fitting in? Well, I think maybe it's a, it's good to kind of look at a spectrum that I see, mm -hmm. which there's a spectrum of medicine, which really starts with, you know, anything from you know, meditation and prayer right. and goes all the way down to things like radiation and surgery. And in the middle of this sort of pyramid, there's all these different modalities, everything from acupuncture and chiropractic work and massage into, you know, food as medicine mm -hmm. and nutritional agents, yeah. and then into botanical medicine as whole agents and formulas, and then, you know, botanical extracts and then isolated botanical compounds, and then into, you know, drugs and things. And, you know, to me, it's all part of medicine. And my focus is on the plants because I really think of plants as medicine, and I think of all of life as medicine at some point. Everything mm -hmm. is medicine at some point. But plants have a really unique place because they're very familiar to us. You know, I mean, it's it's our microbiome, our, our microbiota are just so you know, perfect for working with plant compounds as food, right? I mean, we right, take right, in exactly. complex mixtures of molecules that we would refer to as, you know, air, fluid, food, right. you know, plants, medicine. And so there's a place where food sort of bridges into like a, a medicinal food and then it moves in from there into like a plant medicine. And from there it goes into potent plant medicines that have a narrow therapeutic index. So I think of plants as really being on this spectrum and you know, for me, they're the fun foundational medicine for us. It's our choices every day. That's the medicine that we need to make sure is, is supporting us and not hurting us. And the more we move from that spectrum, from just sort of that food end to that, you know, more directed and mm -hmm. physiologically changing medicine, then the more, you know, we want to be specific about our choices and understand the medicine and how to apply it to a yeah. particular person, right? Well, I think that's, that's really important to illustrate because the way that I think most people interact with food and uh, plants and medicines and everything is, you know, we, we tend to grow up thinking of things of like, well, food keeps you alive. <laughs> right, right. You know, dietary supplements help fulfill some nutritional deficit or whatever. And then you've got pharmaceuticals, which are the real medicine. And, um, right. And, 
you know, what you're illustrating is, is actually the whole spectrum is influencing your pharmacology, your physiology. Um, and it starts to put much more emphasis, emphasis and responsibility on a person to manage how they're engaging with all things in their life and not just thinking of like, I take medicine when I'm sick. Uh, but more more preventative. Well, as as we expected, we kind of jumped right into a, a pretty mm -hmm. critical topic, I think, in in the realm of health and disease, right? And that is just daily choices. And if we think of everything as medicine, or you know, the the, the dose defines the poison, right? I mean, right. you know, even like you think about music, like you know, some music is very uplifting and very just focusing and yep. enhances cognition, and other music can be very dissonant and you know can and, and and that's that's all okay. It's all choices, but when it gets into what we put into our bodies, I think if we could just like I think you said the word was responsibility. Mm -hmm. You know, take responsibility for our everyday choices and how they affect our health or disease and that idea that you said that, you know, as a kid, you started out with, there was food that kept you alive and like, there's like supplements that could give you some nutrients. And then there was medicine, which is pharmacy. Right. right. I mean, within that model, there's no responsibility on you to make any, any choices, mm -hmm. you know, about your health. And so we're basically just supporting a, you know, a pharmaceutical mechanism of disease, of treating disease. You know, if you make the wrong choices, you're <laughs> going to get to the point where you need pharmaceutical medicine. And that's just kind of the way it goes, right? Right. And the reality that we see is that there isn't a, a clear distinction. It's basically, if you make good choices along the way, and you have, yeah, of course, you've got to have good genes, you've got to mm -hmm. have a decent constitution, there's, right. there's factors that yeah. can come in with. But if you just consider everybody sort of on a level playing field, the choices that we make are going to direct us towards, you know, needing those pharmaceutical mm -hmm. medicines or never needing them. You know? Well, and the, uh, the whole concept of diet, I mean, it's changing now, but all throughout my throughout my upbringing, I'm sure yours too, the focus is on, oh, I don't want to be fat. And so you diet mm -hmm. to control your weight, right. not your health. Right. Uh, which are very, very different, different things. things. Absolutely. And I mean, and like the, all these traditional medical systems looked at different, you know, archetypes or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of we, in, the, in, the China, in the Ayurvedic system, they would call it doshas, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that some people are more kophic. They just have, they have a tendency to build more tissue, you know, like in that, some of that might be a little bit of layer of adipose tissue, right? I'm one um, of those people. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and again, it's not a matter of like, Oh, the, the the optimum health of the human being looks like this, and you've got a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, flexing his muscles or something like that. <laughs> right. You know, that's not that's not the real story. Mm -hmm. The real story is that everybody has a place that works for their constitution, for their genetics, for their microbiota, and how that all works together to provide for them, you know, health. Right. And I think you're right. Um, this idea that you know being fat is is a bad thing is is very um, undermining itself well, you know, it sends you on the wrong track exactly yeah you know instead of it's just like hey you know making healthy choices how do you make healthy choices right. just teaching people to make healthy choices and i think there's a lot of you know sickness that goes into and mental sickness i think mental health is such a huge piece of what we're what we're suffering from you know, we look at the physical world right. and our bodies and how we're you know sickness and cancer and everything else but it's really the mental health right that's driving it all well and it's all connected right i mean the the gut brain axis right, absolutely. and everything um you know we now understand that what's going on in the gut is influencing the central nervous system um you know all hugely of, all of these these different pieces and vice versa there's there's this bi-directional communication going on and uh there have been studies looking at things like schizophrenia bipolar autism all sorts of different things that show very strong correlations between gut health and um, how those conditions present themselves. Yeah. Um, and, you know, while you and I might be exposed to that research and, you know, kind of view that as, at this point, kind of common knowledge, I don't think it is to a lot of people, um, you know, just how intimately yeah. those things are connected. Those old patterns or old habits die hard, right? Or die slowly, right. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole field of neurogastroenterology has been just yeah. so fascinating because not only is it this bi-directional communication, but we've found that in the vagus nerve system, right, which right. is this deep endocrine control network, right, which is just basically setting us up for, you know, balance and homeostasis, mm -hmm. that 95% of the signaling between the, the mesenteric, you know, uh, neurological system the network there is going from the gut up to right. the brain that's pretty fascinating right. you know because i've always felt like 
that my my brain or my mind it's here it's not up here like it's being processed here and being filtered and being put through all kinds of channels that i've created through my life experience but there's a place in my gut that i just either know something is right or know something is wrong you know mm -hmm. And I'm always trying to find out how can I tune back into that. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I think a lot of us know. And we're talking about these old patterns and people haven't studied the research yet. But I think most people can agree that a lot of big decisions in their life are gut decisions. If they got it, if they feel it yeah. here, they really feel it. They really know it, you know. And I think that, you know, just bringing back to your original question about, you know, how do I view medicinal plants or how do I think about botanical medicine? And I, th I think it's a, a major ecological influencer. I think you mm -hmm. and I both talk about ecology yeah. and ecosystems a lot. And I think that might be hard for some listeners to to just get, like, what are we talking about? And I really just mean inside the body, what is the material that we're bringing through mm -hmm. the digestive tract, which for all intents and purposes, isn't in, is not in our bodies. It's actually a separate container that we mm -hmm. carry around with us mm -hmm. so that we can hold the material that we are you know, then sticking our roots into like a tree with the ground right. to pull the nutrients out. And we like to carry some around with us so that we can be mobile, mm -hmm. right? Not be a sessile yep. plant, right? Because a plant it's is important a... for survival so yeah. that we can um, go periods of time without eating. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. And, and you know, plants are sessile autotrophs, right? They just sit mm -hmm. in one place and they're nestled into the soil. Yep. And that's a beautiful strategy and it works really well for them. They send out their seeds mm -hmm. and spread their pollen and all that stuff. It's yeah. beautiful to watch that happen. But you know, where we are is taking the energy that they've produced as plants, eating it, carrying it in our bodies and being able to move around and do things. And I think that's really a, an important piece to understand for people that we are doing the same basic thing that all the other life forms are doing here. Yep. We're just basically a tube in one end and a tube on the other end. And in the middle, we have the stuff that we're digesting. And that's what I mean by ecosystem mm -hmm. is that it's not like here's a tube and I'm putting some stuff in it. It's like, no, here is a very complex, seemingly ne infinitely complex network of cells, mm -hmm. you know, immunological cells, things that are happening in my blood, you know, all kinds of my blood, all kinds of growth factors and neurotransmitters and, you know, just a, a huge amount of of structure that makes up me and that's interfacing with this microbiota this this what we call the microbiome which is really right. the dna of those microbiota right mm -hmm. but what does that look like inside as it's filling you know that whole internal canal of my digestive tract with life and that life is then interacting with the ecosystem which i'm calling which is the material i'm putting in in, mm -hmm. the, in the sense of the neurogastroenterology right and it's that balance that really has a huge impact on how we think, mm -hmm. how we feel, our mood, you know, uh, getting upset easily, you know, right. being yeah, calm. Yeah, your tolerance for stimuli. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all that stuff. And so, you know, when I go back to kind of my study of plants and, you know, I was a, I was going to be a medical doctor. That's where I was headed. I was mm -hmm. a, you know, biology student and I went into uh, pre-med and I did three and a half years at the University of Minnesota. I had two offices on campus. I was a TA. I was so into it. But at some point I really started to see that, the single ta target, single molecule, pharmaceutical approach was an approach that was based on treating disease, not on healing people and healing our planet, you know, healing the way yeah. we live. And that's where I shifted. I went into permaculture and mm -hmm. permaculture on this sort of macro scale of how do I live in a way that doesn't leave a bunch of byproducts that the rest of the people have to deal with? How can I live in a way that's mm -hmm. clean, you know? And so I started studying sustainability and permaculture. Yeah. And then when I got to Chinese medicine, it was all about wait a minute, this is permaculture in the human body. Uh -huh. I'm developing yeah. the sustainable ecosystem. And the thing that stands out to me is that what makes us healthy is diversity, right? Mm -hmm. It's not any one bug. It's not any one combination. It's what a diverse microbiota looks mm -hmm. like in one person that supports all this kind of adaptation, adaptability. Yeah. And then the plants come in and you're able to look at a person's constitution from this macroscopic place with Chinese medicine, you take their pulse, look at their tongue, look at their skin, look at their nails, look in their eyes. And we have all these different, you know, deep descriptors mm -hmm. that feed into this system of traditional Chinese medicine, right? Which is yeah. a really a, a holistic system that's self-reflective. And you can start to say, oh, you know, this person has some of this type of ecosystem change, like heat, for example. We mm -hmm. talk a lot about heat or about cold. And then those things, we, we can say, oh, there's some heat in this person and we can use plants that have a cooling nature and that's hard for people to understand what is that that sounds, sounds like woo woo stuff right well it's all about the the language like what what people have to understand is you're using a language to communicate something that's very hard to communicate in the first place like it's 
you, you know, you're using language like hot and cold and cooling and heating and all these sort of things, but really what you're describing is something much more complicated and deep that it just wouldn't really make a lot of sense to try to tease that apart into like a really complicated statement. You know, we have to be able to talk about things kind of quickly and it makes sense to people, even though, if, even if they don't understand, um, the details of how that works, which one reason why I like talking to you is because you do, um, understand a lot about the, um, you know, the pharmacokinetics, these different things that are going on, like what you mean when you say something's cooling right. or heating, it's like, you can get into that if you need to, right. to talk about, um, you know, what's actually happening in the body on a really complex level. But for most people, um, that kind of language is not helpful to them. They right. need something that they can digest themselves. And, and so that language is kind of intuitive, like people can relate to kind of quickly. Um, and it, and it's important to have that balance to not just be able to speak the language, but understand the science and, and details of what you're talking about too. But, um, yeah, I totally see that as it's a, it's a language game more than anything that people kind of have to understand. Yeah. And, and like I said, it's, you know, the word heat in Chinese medicine has a very specific, you know, ter- it has a specific meaning within that system. You right. Know? It's not just like you think of heat, you turn on your burner and right. your stove, right. you know, or your, your thermostat, you know, it's a little bit deeper than that. And it encompasses a lot of modern, you know, physiological concepts, right? Mm -hmm. Things like inflammation, you know, with with, with, redness and things of that nature. Um, But, you know, before going too deep into it, just my my goal mostly is to try to help people see from that macro ecological place, how you can look at a person and see Mm -hmm. how their ecosystem looks viewing them. Right. Like I said, their nails, their hair, their eyes, their skin, mm-hmm. their lips, their, you know, the way they talk, yep. all those things are information for yeah. me about that person. And then if I understand how the materials in the natural world relate to, mm-hmm. let's just say hot and cold, right? I could pick something like silver, right? Which is a very cooling mineral in the sense that it puts a, you know, it puts a damper on inflammatory processes. It right. shuts down that infectious, you know, kind of heat condition that we see in people where mm-hmm. there's pus and there's redness and there's mm-hmm. yellow colors and things. It does a really good job of that. Um, but taking that into the plants, they all have all these different, what we call natures and flavors. Mm-hmm. And so those have been determined and settled on and, you know, and thought about and deliberated on for <laughs> literally millennia, right. you know, by doctors who cared about their patients, cared about their villages, and, you know, cared about the natural materials and how to apply them in an ecological way to the person, right? right. And to that constitution. And so back to that idea of the, the microbiome and how do we alter the way that people think and feel and make good choices? Well, plants have an incredible power and a role mm-hmm. to play there that I think is really unique. And I think it's overlooked, you know? Yeah. One of the places I see you know, a lot of people heading in sort of this health revolution is into functional medicine, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. And functional medicine is, 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 you know, we have David Jones here, you know, right in Ashland. He's one of the founders mm-hmm. of functional medicine. I've sat with him a number of times. Uh, Michael Stone is one of their educators. And so I've been, I've, I've talked to these folks in functional medicine, but they, they tend to apply the nutritional concepts and the, you know, like, looking at the different microbiota that are present, for example, looking at, mm-hmm. you know, what's in the body as far as molds or toxins, Lyme disease, you know, fungal infections, whatever, and then applying, you know, very specific molecules still, you know, mm. and then looking at relationships in, yeah. in lab work and things. But the missing piece is the plants. Right. And a lot of, a lot of these folks do food, but I do plants and I, I do medicine. I, I like plants as medicine as a foundational medicine for the world and that's where i think we should be i think we should be using plants as medicine from everything from how we grow it and farm it and live with it and know it to to sharing it and extracting it and making it a medicine to how we take it and use it in our lives to create balance you know in our ecosystem yeah well and and bringing this all around to cannabis where do you see you know oh yeah cannabis right (laughs) right well and the thing i love about cannabis i've mentioned before is such a good springboard into getting into these deeper topics that need to be talked about and that I think is really important for people to understand as cannabis is getting so popular and people are jumping into it as, you know, uh, folks are recognizing the therapeutic potential of cannabis and are really rushing towards that. And, um, you know, I was speaking with somebody just the other day where we were discussing that one of our concerns is that while people focus on cannabis, they lose sight that cannabis is one component in this medicinal plant toolbox that you and I have talked about the toolbox model. Um, and so uh, can you speak a little bit to 
where cannabis fits in to this overall uh, scheme and and then maybe we can get into a conversation about how cannabis affects the body the endocannabinoid system and all of that that sounds great um i think you know cannabis is of course shrouded in all this you know prohibition and mm -hmm. a lot of political you know struggle and a lot of different energies surrounding well, yeah it. It, 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 it's gotten into a darker place even like just sort of the information we have about it you know i like to start always when i'm looking at what is the benefit of a plant or what are the weaknesses of it or the mm -hmm. potential you know dangers of it i want to see what did the what is the record of that plant look like yeah. across traditional cultures and that's my number one form of evidence, you know, again, it's not like, you know, people talk about, oh, it's woo woo, it's folk medicine, whether you call it that or not, mm -hmm. those people were carrying oral traditions and written traditions about medicines to help their people that they cared a lot about. Mm -hmm. They didn't have time to sit around and go to the movies. No, mm -hmm. they were, they were living mm -hmm. and it was, life was a struggle for a lot of people and medicine was really important. So there's a lot of heart in it. There's a lot of intention in it and there's a lot of empiricism. So I always go there first and what I've done with cannabis, you know, when my kind of digging into what is cannabis as a medicine, I've had to cut through that same kind of shrouding and sort of darkness of like, how, what, what really is it? When looking back at what are the records from Chinese medicine and the use of cannabis? And I've looked at deeply into it and tried to find what are the threads, yeah. you know, cause most of the time in, you know, in school in medical school with Chinese medicine and the doctors from China stuff, it's just kind of, we don't talk about it. You yeah. know, you, of course the hemp seed, you know, everybody knows that that's, you know, nutritional. You know, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's generally, there's a, a couple of great formulas that use madza ren and ma is the word in chinese for for china, for mm -hmm. hemp or cannabis right for marijuana um and so madza zi is a seed and so you got madza oh, gotcha. is a the, the seed of the cannabis plant right and so that seed has been used really successfully for um, moistening up the bowels and helping with constipation and you combine it with other herbs that have other you know peristaltic mm -hmm. actions or you know pull some fluids into the large intestine you know right. and then like you know mirabolitum things like that and then those will all work to kind of create this bowel but but beyond that you start digging into what was actually cannabis used for as a mm -hmm. medicine and was it was it cannabis in the sense of you know thc rich or was mm -hmm. it cannabis in the sense of hemp was it ragweed was it it's really hard to determine that from the records that we do have, but there is some consistency across the writings I've examined um, in using cannabis for conditions that involve, you know, something in Chinese medicine called wind, which I've talked about with you before, which is like the idea that there's an instability in the body. Mm -hmm. So there's a homeostatic stabilizing kind of effect mm -hmm. from cannabis um, where, you know, it's, it's, it's instability in the mood. There's um, things like, ticks and twitches and tremors and dyskinesias and things of that nature that cannabis was really good for that it's been recorded that people would use it for that and again it's hard to understand were they using cbd at that time right. or was it a strain that was blended and we don't really know the records are hard to follow um but clearly it was used for problems of the mind you know people having anxiety mm -hmm. schizophrenia you know people that had you know mental instabilities it would really help to bring back some balance to them and um you know one of the things that i, I saw that people used was they made a um, a cannabis wine mm -hmm. and it was made you know so they would take like a it was it was like more like a cannabis wine extraction I guess but they would take their rice or sorghum wine that they would mm -hmm. make right they'd ferment those yeah. grain you know the grain and create you know an ethanol rich solution and of course we know that you know ethanol is a great way to extract cannabinoids right mm -hmm. you know and so they would they would take the seeds with the coating on the seed you know the uh, what, what do you call that the it's, it's not the calyx, but it's actually, there's a, a coating around the seed as it you know sits on the plant. And that coating is covered in little hairs, right? Little trichomes. Right. So it's got a lot of cannabinoid on it. But so they would put the seeds with those little trichomes into their solution and they'd extract it and they'd give it as this cannabis wine and they'd give it to patients for different conditions. So it's clearly been used that way and it has a, you know, it's very safe medicine. Um, but I think that part of the problem is just that we have a hard time understanding um, with this plant, the differences in its phenotypes, you know, in, in the mm -hmm. different types right. or cultivars of cannabis, which are so, which is one of the things that makes the plant really unique. You know, mm -hmm. you can get a very different physiological effect from right. one strain, right, than another. And that's, you know, and, and there, to some degree, some plants have that, but very few and to that degree. And I think it's one of the things that makes cannabis unique and fascinating to yeah. me um, is, is just that, you know, God, there's so much. And we talk about what does cannabis do? I'm like, well, man, yeah, which what what part of cannabis? Which cannabis are you talking about? Yeah, you know? how are you using it? Yeah, and it's a 
you know, one reason why cannabis has caught the eye of a lot of pharmaceutical companies is because it's a very effective biochemical factory yeah. you know, as far as its resin content and the types and diversity of, of uh, compounds that it produces. And then when you start thinking about how that can be manipulated either through breeding or genetic modification or whatever, um, there is just some massive potential um, to use cannabis as a tool to create all sorts of, of different chemical compounds in a much more efficient way in much higher concentrations than most plants are able to do. Um, so it'll be interesting to see long term what cannabis becomes because now that hemp is legal in the United States and now that um, THC rich cannabis is gaining acceptance in the United States, you know, at least on a state level, um, we're going to see very interesting things, I think, as far as where people take the plant and how they use it. And, you know, we're still contributing to this millennia long record of medicinal plant use. And so we're entering an interesting time now where we're kind of coming out of the dark ages with cannabis and now generating a lot of information, a lot of data that, you know, man, people that um, come through 100 years from now um, will be able to probably glean a lot of interesting wisdom that we may not be able to perceive directly since we're kind of in it right, right now, trying to tease some of the stuff out, different cannabinoid ratios using different parts of the plant. Um, even on the beyond the medicine side, how cannabis can be used as building materials and contributing to fuels and, you know, all sorts of stuff that, um, and being used as a bioremediation tool. Um, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to, to see what yeah. we learn. Yeah. And I think, well, I mean, you were talking about the toolbox, you know, and what, what is, right. how does it fit into the toolbox? And I think I find it, I find it difficult to place it because, it's been shrouded and because it's in the darkness, because we yeah. don't really know which part of it does wit, which, and we, and so, and we've been kind of thinking of it more in molecular terms, right? We're thinking right. about THC, we're thinking about mm -hmm. CBD, we're thinking about terpenes, sometimes thinking about flavonoids. Right. But in general, we're kind of thinking about it in these molecular terms. Whereas with most of the plants that I use, sure, I like to make sure that the plant is a potent mm -hmm. example of that plant species, that it has the medicine I'm looking for in it. So I want it standardized to some percentage of an right. active. Yeah. yeah not because that molecule is the, the thing that's doing the work. We found in a lot of studies that the molecule actually alone doesn't do the work. That's actually, it needs to be the molecule in the matrix of plant compounds that represent yeah. that medicine. Um, and so I think it's just, it, it's, it's sort of changing that perspective as a plant on how we identify that medicine, how do we use it? And I think a lot of people are, you know, so I've heard this, this, this sort of, approach from a lot of folks who are deep in the cannabis as medicine field it's that oh and what we really need to do is just take apart the plant pull it into all its pieces and mm -hmm. then select which pieces we want to put together put them together and apply it to the thing that we want to treat mm -hmm. and that's sort of you know that's kind of like franken medicine like it's not reverse again, engineering reverse engineering and, and reverse engineering can be really helpful but i mm -hmm. think we have to be careful here um because it's hard to understand what you lose mm -hmm you know, from like a purely molecular analysis, yeah. what do we actually lose about, and maybe I'll just say this, that the, that the spirit of the plant, you know, yeah. and, and that's again, getting into some woo woo territory, but you know, you know me, I, I'm going to bridge spirit <laughs> to the deepest reductionist science. It's kind of your, your like role in life is just bridging those worlds. Bridge together. those worlds. I love <laughs> it. You know, that's, that's, and, and it's really important to me. And I think it's profound for our culture to, to recognize that those two things exist simultaneously. Yeah. Um, but so that there's a spirit of the plant and there's a spirit of it. And I think with cannabis, you know, it's got such a long, rich history. And you think about India and you think about the Ganges and you think mm -hmm. about this sort of like the, the steeping of that plant in this spiritual path to enlightenment mm -hmm. and what it represents. And, you know, it's sort of there was there's a whole part of it, too, with the sadhus and the sort of like removing yourself from society and culture and like going other. And there's a lot of stigma and there's all this. Mm -hmm. But it's just really wrapped up in so much of who we are. Um, and we've evolved it for so long. I think that the plant itself is a very sensitive creature. It's a very sensitive, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what I call it, like a life form. And and it 
I think that it picks up energy, you know, and I'm talking again on these little bit more quantum or esoteric level about how the way that it's grown, the way that it's cared for, the way that it's harvested, the way that it's being ingested. Right. I think those things are exceptionally important with cannabis because of its deep connection to our psyche, our spiritual path. You know what I'm saying? I mean, well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, to put it in more practical terms, um, the way a plant's handled changes its chemistry dramatically. The way that um, <clears throat> a, a plant like cannabis is administered in the body changes um, how your experience with it, you know, is, is going to be, whether you're eating it or inhaling it or how you're preparing it. Um, you know, it's all influencing these, these different things. And because a lot of um, the compounds that cannabis makes are, you know, in the growth cycle, you know, just thinking about terpenes are so influenced by environment and cannabinoids to a lesser extent, but still somewhat. And um, so how you process that plant is going to affect that chemical profile, how you store that plant, how you um, then later process that plant into a product that you're going to consume, whether it be foods or teas or whatever you're going to do um, has that influence. And then getting into, um, an equally complex area trying to understand the endocannabinoid system tone of a person and what influences that their lifestyle, their diet, all of these things, the way that you live is going to influence how you respond, uh, to cannabis because it, it's, it's changing all these things. And so, you know, on my side, like when I hear you, you know, using that language, you know, the uh, sensitivity to the energies and everything to me, that's just, uh, because of my hyper like analytical chemistry, you know, the side of things and thinking about, uh, my experience with all of that, to me, that makes sense. And I can, I can understand that from my vocabulary and my, you know, perspective of how I see it to me that gels together. Um, and makes, like you can see makes it makes in sense. the, in that sort of reductionist view, yeah, right? you can see when it. You look down, when you, when you break it. down to the parts, yeah. you can see the parts have changed, right? Right. Based exactly. on the choices that were made. And of course we're back to the ecosystem, you know, yeah. and back to that permaculture idea. And so how do we take care of the, you know, the plant? And I think, I mean, just like I'm in, I'm in Jackson County, Oregon here, right? There's 9,000 acres of <laughs> hemp in this County, in this one County this yeah. year, you yeah. know? And when you see these farms, they all, almost every single one of them is using sheets and sheets of single use, thin black plastic. Yeah. Huge monoculture farms. I'm like, again, back to the energetics of the plant, yeah. you know, and not, and, and the plant itself, it's a representation of how we are acting. You know, we're trying to make this medicine to heal, but then really a lot of the drive is for the money, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that, that unfortunate oh, yeah. relationship between money and medicine has gotten us into all kinds of trouble. Well, and it, you know, yeah, it, it comes down to like, what do you really value and how are you making those decisions? And to touch on something you said a minute ago that, that ties into this of like, we don't know all of the little things about the chemistry of the plant that are influencing therapeutic outcomes. And there's research in Israel that is um, demonstrating this in a very direct way. There's a researcher, I think his name's David Meary, if I'm pronouncing that right, um, that has a lab in Israel with like um, several dozen researchers there that are exploring all of these minor constituents of cannabis. And, you know, they're not just characterizing a dozen or a couple of dozen cannabinoids. They're looking at, you know, 50 to 100 cannabinoids in products and seeing how little manipulations to those affect therapeutic outcomes. Um, they're looking at, you know, hundreds of terpenes at a time and trying to understand those differences. And, you know, the wisdom that they're gleaning is that, yeah, this is a very complex uh, picture here, uh, a very complex puzzle that we're trying to piece together. And that there are a lot of components of cannabis that, you know, right now in Oregon, if you go to a cannabis lab, you're not going to be able to get quantitative data on, you know, the hundred plus cannabinoids that are in the plant or the, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of terpenes, you know, the several dozens of characterized flavonoids, the stilbonoids, the sterols, all these different things that are interacting together. And that there's research now that shows that flavonoids interact directly with the endocannabinoid system in a very direct way, which then has implications for all plants and how they're interacting with the system which then ties into, and this is just one example, but how that ties into, well, what you're eating is going to affect your experience with cannabis and because it's influencing your endocannabinoid system tone. The puzzle is super complex. And 
we have to be really, really careful about how we're making decisions about what to value. And in these larger agricultural models, you know, it's like, well, we're valuing CBD content, THC content, maybe a few other cannabinoids, resin yield, um, bud structure, um, you know, picking a few choice variables, valuing those, and then creating high intensity production models to churn, you know, that out. Um, and sometimes not recognizing that the consequence is sacrificing the unknown and possibly unknowable variables um, that are getting lost in that, that, you know, some of the more sort of craft cultivation, that's kind of what's been called now, the craft cannabis, you know, world. Um, yeah, it were, people were putting a lot of time and energy into uh, much smaller numbers of plants, um, having a much more intimate relationship with those plants, understanding how they're changing and cultivating, handling them very delicately as they're being processed. Those products are very different than what gets churned out in high intensity sort of big ag, you know, models. And I think there, there are places for all of this to coexist. I don't like seeing huge monoculture farms, period. And, and so, you know, I've studied permaculture, so it's, it's good that we have that, that common background. Um, and my background in ecology, because, I mean, before I got into all of this, I was working with the BLM, working on restoration projects, trying to understand native plant populations, the roles that they're serving in ecosystems, and kind of how we need to think about how to restore ecosystems that are in the process of falling apart, essentially, usually because of human activity. Um that thinking really needs to be integrated into cannabis because cannabis has this such rich opportunity right now to do things differently than as has been established in big agricultural models for corn and wheat, you know, all these. Yeah. And, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, the momentum is coming so fast and there's so much money to be made that it's, it's like you're swimming against the current. Um, but it's important, I think, to keep pressing that message and highlighting. And I think my point of saying all of this is even with a reductionist model, the research, I think, is going to prove that perspective um, worthwhile and very valuable, that there are these hundreds, thousands of compounds being influenced and getting lost, and the therapeutic outcomes are not going to be the same. Um, well, and this all ties back to, you know, how does cannabis fit into the medicinal right plant toolbox, right? Yeah. And it's a complex answer, you know, and I think there's a lot of folks out there. Well, and I'll, and I'll say for me, I like to use cannabis a little bit separate. Most of the plants here, I'd like to think of them in terms of a formula. Yeah. How would I formulate that plant with other plants to make mm -hmm. a medicine that's good for a person, for a condition? Right. And with cannabis, in the, in the realm of topicals, I've been able to do that, you know, much more easily, uh, integrating cannabis in with topicals as far as mostly pain relief right. or yeah. inflammation control. But when it comes to, you know, giving people an herbal formula to treat their constitution, I, I generally have cannabis as a separate tool. It's over here and I, I can add it to what I'm doing or I can, you know, bring it in as a synergist if I wanted to help somebody sleep. Maybe they'll you know, bring in some CBD to help them sleep. Or if they're having anxiety, I could bring in some CBD, but also have a formula of herbs, you know, that would be there to help them sleep as well. Mm -hmm. A nervine tonic, you know, with yeah. things like scutellaria, lateral flora, flora, the American skull cap, you know, and, you know, passion flower and things of that nature, kava, kava, mm -hmm. you know, piper, yeah. and the, you know, things that are just going to be nice and calming. And then just bring the cannabis in separate. And Again, I feel like I'm kind of playing in the dark with cannabis because of what you're talking about, because it's such a diverse plant with such a diverse array of constituents that then impart a diverse array of physiological effects that it's just hard to, to know it. And so, you know, I feel like these sort of, I think I use the word boutique, you use the word craft, mm -hmm. the kind of like the, the smaller care for medicine that people put into their products where they're like, I really want this plant because it gives me this type of a, a feeling when I use it, when I smoke mm -hmm. it or when I ingest it. And I really appreciate that, you know, and mm -hmm. that's not just, of course, those people want to make money too. Everybody's got to make a living, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, we're at a point where I feel like there's two different divergent paths that cannabis is bringing us to. One is 
another big cash grab and another mm-hmm. big, in, you know, God, I, who cares about the environment? You know, it's, I see it in the hospitals too. It's like, well, we just got to help this person right now. So just throw all this garbage away and don't worry about it for now. This is the emergency we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I've got to make this money. And I'm just, I, this is my moment to make it. And I'll, 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 I'll take care of it later. I'll pick it up <laughs> later, but this and it later never okay, happens. Yeah, so we just exactly. keep making garbage. Right. And then that keeps happening. And there's that end of it. But then on the other side of it, there's this opportunity where I see that the way that people are seeing cannabis as an opportunity for resource, you know, that can generate a lot of resource, that it's it's kind of acting like, as I've said before, the tip of the spear into uh, an expansion of what our look at plant medicine really is. And it's yeah. it's it's deepening our sort of chemical analysis and or you know our testing parameters, our extraction mm-hmm. tools, everything is changing and growing and becoming you know just this focal on cannabis, but it can branch out to all the plants. Right. And we can start to take that technology and start enhancing our use of all plant medicine. I think it's it has that capacity. It I'm does, hoping yeah. that we get that and not more of just the I think it, I think we will. I think you know it's going to be going in both directions regardless. And it's a matter of, it's like how much energy is being put into each stream and that's going to determine how far it gets over, over time. Um, but going back to the springboard effect, I, almost everyone that I talk to when we're talking about cannabis, the conversation always ends up going beyond cannabis. And, you know, when I do seminars or workshops or whatever, we get into discussions about, about cannabis and someone always ends up making the connection on their own like what does this mean for other plants and what does this mean for food and you know starting to to piece that together that um everything that we're learning about cannabis it does apply directly and then it opens up new perspectives about these other plants and how we can interact with them and and think about them research them and you know that's what i'm really excited uh about as a researcher is you know, I think that cannabis over time is going to end up um, influencing and promoting a lot of really interesting natural products research broadly because it's going to change perspectives. And, um, you know, it's cool as a scientist because that means that there will then be a lot of kind of low-hanging fruit, cool projects to do that aren't even necessarily that complicated that you can do with all sorts of plants that's very worthwhile to do to try to understand and build more information that other people will then use and go in other directions. And, you know, we're all feeding this kind of hive mind, this, you know, sort of higher level consciousness of, you know, how culture and society is going to play out in the years to come. And um, so that has me excited and I think it is going to happen, but yeah, it's just a matter of how, how is our society going to value all of that and put resources and energy into it? Um, because the money, the, the gold rush thing is, is very real. And that's going to influence a lot Mm -hmm. of, a lot of behavior. It's scary. You know, it's, it's scary to me to see where that's going. Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, we saw what happened with opiates, you know, and the whole opioid movement. And there's lots right. of different opioids. And then, of course, the, the big push is to make synthetic opioids that you can patent and then sell. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, yeah. and, and, of course, that's going to happen with cannabinoids, too. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, maybe if you don't mind, we could just jump into one of the kind of like the questions that you had mapped out as a possibility. And this was just sort of like looking at the research mm-hmm. kind of end of things. Yeah. And, you know, for me, I feel like we're having, I think we're at sort of the end of the research arc of the revolution of sort of efficacy research. Mm-hmm. It's still being promoted and pushed because it's a great way to sell a drug. You know, right. if, if I'll just map, you know, the difference between efficacy research and effectiveness research mm-hmm. is that effectiveness really looks at a therapy or a therapeutic approach. Clinical significance. Clinical significance. Like, yeah, yeah were, was, was I able to affect a positive change in a patient population using an, a technique or, yes. yeah. or a, you know, a way of formulation or something like that doesn't require this efficacy model which says is this molecule effective for this condition Mm -hmm. and that's a great way to sell a drug you -hmm. know and there are cases where we can still really use that you know especially especially in cancer you know there are some places where targeting a specific you know tar in a molecular receptor or a pathway can be very powerful in in a disease process like cancer that gets out of control really easily but I want to find out, you know, how is cannabis effective 
and how are, is plant medicine effective for different conditions when applied using some principles, you know, mm -hmm. like using some basic uh, you know, approaches to medicine. And so I want to see a divergence in, the, in, in how we prove something's value mm -hmm. as a medicine. And yeah. I feel like we're stuck in a place where the money and the cash grab is driving us to keep using this archaic model that was really, you know, a model set up in the, you know, 30s and 40s mm -hmm. of, you know, to, to prove out these pharmaceutical medicines and that they were more, they were powerful because they were going to direct function. Right. We want to be in control. Mm -hmm. And in the emergency room, heck yeah, I want to, I want, I want to be in control in the emergency room, you know, exactly. someone, someone comes it's in an acute, with like, acute chest pain, I, man, let's get them on nitroglycerin. Let's throw, you know, these guy has got an ST wave, you know, elevation. We've got, you know, this person's having a cardiac event. We need to get them taken care of. We need some single molecules to block some pathways mm -hmm. and keep them alive. Awesome. But I, you know, what I, where I see cannabis and where I see plant medicine is in day-to-day -day health. Mm -hmm. And I don't, we don't need to use that model to understand how those things affect our, you know, our health and disease, right. you know? And so I, you know, I don't know how to make that bridge, but I'm pushing for my own work and my own, you know, search for meaning and search for what am I here to do? I want to try to help proliferate a, a way of approaching medicine, a way of, of mm -hmm. proving that looking at a person's lab work, combining it with looking at their mm -hmm. Chinese medicine yeah. diagnosis, and then using natural materials, maybe some drugs too, if they need them, but whatever, but a combination, but that that approach would be effective for patients. Mm -hmm. How do we move from the efficacy of that single molecule single target to, to a more, what I would call a more useful and pragmatic, you know, right. research approach? Yeah, much more, in a much more individualized um, approach. So, you know, some of the folks that I've talked to so far have gone into this direction too, talking about, you know, to get to that, there has to be a focus on the patient and their circumstances. Not the disease, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. A much more um, integrated model of what's going on with the patient and not just sort of having this tunnel vision of focusing just on a single condition and how to influence those symptoms, you know, or um, that pathology, but taking those blinders off and looking at the person as a whole person and taking their lifestyle and all these different influences of what they're dealing with and trying to but that, that takes a lot of time, and that's, you know, the problem with the current healthcare model is patients don't have that much time to spend w with doctors because doctors are having to cycle people through. They they have, you know, what, 10 minutes sometimes? That's pretty much standard, right? 10 yeah. Minutes, yeah. Um, and so in order to get a full picture of somebody, you know, it means that you can't have as many patients um, and, you know, that you're going to have to do a lot more monitoring. It takes a lot more um, critical thinking um, to balance all of these pieces. And I think something you said is, is really important about being open to all of these um, um, treatment options, you know, so not excluding pharmaceuticals, recognizing that they do have a role in um, certain situations and, and trying to understand that balance of getting all of this incorporated, the lifestyle, the diet, um, you know, supplemental herbs and things to influence um, someone's natural states or, you know, whatever they're trying to go through and recognizing the role that pharmaceuticals have and not trying to, you know, one issue that, you know, we have in the natural products world and in um, sort of herbalism and everything is sometimes there's this kind of intense tribalism. It's like, we're so anti-pharma, like we will right. not engage right. pharmaceuticals at all. And I don't, think that's a useful approach you've got to understand like like you started off saying this this pyramid the spectrum that it's all a part of health and wellness and um you know one thing that i visualize is you know it's like we're going through these pendulum swings and starting in you know the early 1900s there was this swing away from uncontrollable medicines and variables and everything towards hyper standardized hyper controlled um, research models and going towards single ingredient, single active compound ways of thinking. And now it seems like the pendulum's swinging back towards um, thinking about things as cultures used to about, um, you know, getting in back into traditional Chinese medicine and everything, getting more into that holistic picture again. And, you know, it probably won't swing as far as it started, but, you know, it's going to oscillate. Yeah. And until, yeah, it, until it comes towards some more happy medium, some synthesis, 
between you know these different perspectives and recognizing under what circumstances to engage all of these these tools yeah i think it's well said and you know i like i think you said i think that that's one of my what i say one of my missions in mm-hmm. life is to to bridge that yeah. those worlds and i think one of the things that came in my mind as you were speaking was the word alternative right right and you know cannabis of course was part of alternative culture counterculture mm-hmm. for a long time and so it still kind of gets put into this alternative medicine realm and i think one of the things that's been really alarming to me as as a person who spends most of my time in the field of medicine with cancer mm-hmm. patients um is that about 8 years ago people started coming to me saying hey I need help. I'm going to cure my cancer with cannabis, yeah. with, with marijuana. And I would say, really? Okay, what's going on with that? You know, so I started seeing more people. People would call me like, oh, I heard that you know some things about cannabis and that, mm-hmm. you know, you could help me. I want to cure my cancer with cannabis. And I was like, well, okay. I mean, it sounds like the next silver bullet to me, which doesn't <laughs> exist, right? right? Uh, you know, cancer is an incredibly complex yes, disease. People yes. are complex organisms. How can one thing do all of that? Of course, as time came to bear, I saw that a lot of people died, mm-hmm. literally. You know, and I I would advise them, hey, you know, I think you need to, you know, really consider some oncological therapy. We need to, you know, you're losing the momentum here, and it's a momentum game with cancer. Mm-hmm. It's trying to gain enough of its own resource generation and using yep. what you have faster than you can maintain your own resource to build yourself. And there's this crazy struggle there, and if cancer starts winning that battle, it's really hard to turn it around, even with really mm-hmm. powerful plant medicine or any kind of right. thing. You know, sometimes you just need, you know, you need, a, you know, an intervention like a targeted therapy an immunotherapy, a chemotherapy, even radiation in some outside, you know, mm-hmm. cases or surgery, you know, to, to yeah. debulk it and then go after it. And, you know, I'm, I'm very selective and very specific about my choices, especially when it's concerning the life of someone and then their mm-hmm. family and how it affects their community. You know, it's a big deal to make a choice. And yeah. so, you know, I I got really put off by the fact that there was basically one person promoting, you know, sort of like this path to curing cancer. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to say any names, yeah. but it was like the idea that this person cured their cancer. Well, they cured basal cell carcinoma, a skin cancer that's basically just you just cut it out and remove it. I can put, you know, blood root and turmeric on it and just have it come out. You know, mm-hmm. I've just seen so many of those go away. But they're taking that and then interpreting it as, oh, cannabis cures cancer and to me it speaks to a deep loss of hope a loss of a sense of you know i I can do this or i'm empowered i need Mm -hmm. you know everybody feels like it's so disempowering to have to go and become the thing that needs to get help like Mm -hmm. to get big money and big therapy to treat you you know like oh man i want to i don't want to do that i'm scared of that so i need to find the thing that's going to cure me and it's a very revolutionary thought it's a very rebellious Mm -hmm. thought and I, i feel it too i really want there to be you know, a cure for cancer, right? But there's no cure for cancer. You know, it's not, you can't cure cancer like in one, you know, it's like, there's, it's a incredibly complex thing. And I would love to elaborate on at some point, Mm -hmm. you know, all my kind of like seven different sort of metaphors of cancer, as I call them, how Mm -hmm. it relates to as within, so without and how cancer manifests and then how we have to address it. And of course, prevention, I mean, you know, that's what we can do. You know, we used to talk about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in cancer. My, my adage is an ounce of prevention is worth a ton of cure. Yeah. Yeah. Because the cure is so challenging damaging yeah. and challenging oh my god you know like you know people it, it's a, a long story but you know swinging back around i think that that was the thing that concerned me the most about cannabis was that wow people are going to take this medicine and they they're going to fill their desire and their need mm-hmm. to have that hope for the cure for all of our all of what ails us it's never going to be that. I don't care what it is. Right. Cannabis just filling that next. It's just the next thing to fill that that void in us. And the void is only filled by us changing our approach to life. You know, we mm-hmm. are the the problem, right? Whether it's from overpopulation to microplastics, mm-hmm. and, you know, all right. greens and da 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 da. Right, it goes on and on. You know, and so <sighs> cannabis has a role to play, and I just I want to help find what that role is, mm-hmm. and I want it to find a place where it's well understood for what it can do mm-hmm. and what it can't do. 
Yeah. What its strengths are and what its weaknesses are. Yep. Where it could actually hurt someone. Yes. You know, because everybody looks at it as a, you know, it's it's got this sort of and natural medicine had that for a long time too. Mm-hmm. Like if it's natural, it means it's good for you. Right. Are you right. kidding me? Digitalis is a great plant, but you know, you walk out in there, grab one flower, you're dead. Right. Like that. You know, I'm sorry. That's you know, we, we need to this is real. This is, it is yeah. this is you know, stuff. And so yeah, you know This is this is critical. I mean, part of this podcast, um, one of the things I try to ask most people are one, and I'll ask you this too, what are the common misconceptions that you run into about cannabis? And you just indicated one, but also what are the therapeutic limitations about cannabis? Because so much um, attention gets brought on its therapeutic potential and there is good potential. There's a lot of great things that cannabis can do along with a lot of other plants um, that can do great things as well. Um, But there needs to be more attention on the very real limitations and things like drug interactions, um, you know, different contraindications uh, when you know, people really need to be more conscious of cannabis use and how it can negatively affect them. Because um, I think the stat about there being no uh, defined lethal overdose limit for cannabis has then been teased out into, well, it must do no harm um, and thus, you know, can use it in any context, in any amount, in any form, and, you know, it's safe. And, um, nothing is that simple, right? Nothing is that simple. No. And I think, you know, you're talking about interactions, right? And I think that's, that's one of the places that I do a lot of work, especially a lot of professional people coming to me because I've become an expert in herb drug interactions. I had to be, you know, I mean, I've got people taking, you know, narrow, narrow therapeutic index drugs. That means a drug that, you know, the therapeutic dose is very close to the toxic dose. So there's a really tight window there Mm -hmm. and people are taking these drugs, you know, whether it's for HIV or whether it's for, you know, graft versus host disease, you know, they're trying Mm -hmm. to not have an organ rejection or in cancer therapies, you know, where you've got really intensive doses of chemotherapy, people going into induction, you know, where you're dropping their neutrophil counts to zero. There's all kinds of things are happening. So you have to be really conscious and careful about what you choose. But the thing that overarches the botanical medicine end of it is that at least you know coming from a a natural medicine approach or like a a Mm -hmm. traditional system like Chinese medicine where you're almost always using a formula Mm -hmm. of multiple ingredients each ingredient itself is not hyper concentrated Mm -hmm. you can increase the number of grams of the material to get more of the actives Mm -hmm. but those actives are going to be combined with literally hundreds and hundreds of other compounds. So let's say the ginger, like there's like 570 compounds identified in ginger, right? right. Find it in a lot of formulas as a GI kind of support, helps to digest mm-hmm. things, helps reduce toxicities of other things. So it shows up in a lot of things. But let's say that the, the formula has 12 herbs in it and each one of them has, let's just say 570. Well, we're, we're now, now we're into, you know, 6,000 molecules. Mm-hmm. Unique yeah. molecules. All tugging at receptors in different ways, doing different things. Exactly. So, so at that point, it's like, well... You know, herb drug interactions is mostly theoretical Mm -hmm. because we think of herbs as drugs. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not drugs. You can talk about them in a certain sense. You could say, well, it's all if it's a drug, if it affects your physiology. Well, then you have to say that, you know, food is a drug, too. And it's it's okay. And everything is a drug on that level. But Mm -hmm. more down to defining a a pharmaceutical isolated molecule given Mm -hmm. at a concentration that is super physiological, meaning it would never appear that way in nature or show Mm -hmm. up in your body that way, is very different than giving a group of plants. And so among those 6,000 molecules, sure, there may, you know, some of them are going to affect this cytochrome P450 enzyme. Some of them are going to affect this one. But, you know, we know there's a lot to that. And, you know, you've got one or two medications coming in at high concentrations that are going to be requiring a huge metabolic output of the body of an enzymatic breakdown of those molecules. They're going to really clog up a couple of those detox pathways, right? Those metabolic Mm -hmm. pathways. But the plant has this real wide you know, effect. And so in general, the plants are a lot safer as far as their interactions are concerned. What concerns me is when we start going, well, we're going to start taking THC Mm -hmm. and giving you 500 milligrams a day, a thousand milligrams Mm -hmm. a day, 1500 milligrams a day. And I see people taking that much at that level. Well, you're going to have to metabolize that molecule through some pathways that are going to be useful for other drugs or other agents too. And that's why I start to get into these things about concentration. And then at that level, what's happening? I think that, you know, we've talked about this before that in in the herb drug interaction from cannabis and, you know, in CBD Mm -hmm. or, you know, with uh, other uh, 
drugs, isolated molecules, we're mostly seeing that the data so far says that it's pretty low risk unless right. you're getting into higher concentrations, right? Right, right. And you probably have some research data on that. I know we've discussed it, but... Yeah, I mean, it's getting more complicated as more data comes out because now, now there's starting to be some evidence that even lower dosages of like CBD particularly um, is having drug interactions that previously were thought wouldn't happen until you were taking grams of CBD a day or something. It's actually, you know, no, it's, it's more complex than that. And part of that is CBD interacting on enzymes that break down other drugs. Part of it is uh, your diet. I mean, you know, like, I talk about the grapefruit effect in the context of CBD to illustrate that, you know, this is a concept we already know about. And there are drugs that have a warning on them that say, hey, don't consume grapefruit while you take this drug. Um, if you see that warning, that that applies to CBD as well. Um, and what we're what research is trying to tease out now is at what point does that effect become very problematic? At what dosage? And that gets complicated when you start thinking about things like isolate, uh, CBD isolate versus... Um, distillate versus broader spectrum extracts versus herbal cannabis. Um, they have the effects are different. Um, but there are a lot of other foods, common foods, tomatoes, all sorts of things that also influence those enzymes. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's complicated. And I was wondering from your experience working with patients and seeing patient outcomes um, of folks that are trying to. Um, sometimes do their own treatments and are coming to you trying to understand, um, you know, what might be going on. Like, what sort of um, negative effects or drug interactions have you seen with cannabis, whether it be CBD or THC? We can tease out the the differences, but what have you kind of witnessed so far? And you mentioned a little bit of what makes you nervous, but can you speak to any um, specific instances that kind of highlight? Um, you well, know, I mean, I'll just concerns? I'll just say that I had, you know. A number of patients, you know, and of course these are, I'm thinking of stage four, you know, cancer patients, breast cancer, mm -hmm. stage four, for example, you know, someone who's like, well, I want to, you know, I want to use cannabis to, to heal my cancer and, you know, th they're losing the battle. So they decide, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and do a combination. I'm going to combine the, you know, the high dose cannabinoids mm -hmm. with, you know, oncological therapy. Well, we don't know, you know, whether that mm -hmm. high dose of that molecule is going to change the way that that drug works in a positive way or in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Could it be inhibiting the drug's activity at that certain concentration? Right. We don't know, you know, and, and we want to think that cannabis is all good, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, it's, it can't be, nothing is, it <laughs> yeah. just, it, it all is. And so we need to understand how it works. Uh, you know, I think there are some areas where you might see some interactions when people are doing, um, you know, benzodiazepines, for mm. example, you know, very nerves, nervous system calming, um, therapies that when you start to get into some of the, the, the CBD and THC, you can have amplified effects, you know, or some, gotcha. get, you know, sedation yeah. can be increased or things like that, which gets, it gets to be a factor when you think about people driving, exactly. and, you know, yeah. these are concerns. And I think you bring up a really good point because as much as we can see now looking in the future about what the potential pitfalls are, we're going to protect ourselves because it's, it doesn't take many bad things to happen mm -hmm. until like major regulations come in and a, you know, a, a yeah, real big yeah. shift happens as to what is available to us. Um, so the more we can be thoughtful, careful, you know, and, and actually look into it and research what the possible interactions are, I think the, the better off we're going to be, of course, it's just that it's a, you know, it's not a very big money-making area. It's much <laughs> yeah. more lucrative to grow a lot of plants and process it and sell them. Right. Um, and even if you're making a drug, for example, it's more about, you know, is it effective for pain or something rather than it is, is it going to interfere? But I was just going to say in the, in those stage of four cancer patients, you know, a lot of them just, they just died, you know, they just, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work. You know, mm -hmm. the combination of the cannab cannabinoid and the drug didn't work. I will say also that I think with, with the, um, inhaled cannabis, mm -hmm. especially vaporized. Yeah. I really don't worry about drug interactions, um, with people, you know, especially if you've got a person who's going through chemotherapy and they're suffering from nausea and appetite loss, right. And, you know, like the benefits to vaporized cannabis in that context, I mean, it's, it's the best medicine that I've ever experienced. And I've talking about dozens to maybe hundreds of patients that have, that I've guided them through yeah. that with. And it's remarkable that they're able to actually take their therapy because the, 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 
the medicine of the cannabis allows them to overcome the symptoms caused by the medication. Right. But the medication right. is actually doing something good. It's killing their cancer, mm -hmm. you know, and, and of course there's more, it's, it's a complex story about that. But, um, you know, I think in those contexts, whatever we don't know, I think it's okay. Yeah. You know, and I've seen a lot of people do that and come through with flying colors, you know. Well, a big part of that is like if you can deal with the nausea, then you can eat more. You have more strength. Your body's able to do its own work to protect healthy cells from the damaging effects of things like radiation or chemotherapy. And and so the, the likelihood that you'll have a positive outcome with that conventional um, therapy for cancer treatment um, increases. And I think I think that's a very... Um, valuable tool. And, uh, you know, back in the 80s, researchers were catching on to that. That's why Marinol exists on the market was to treat um, cancer-related nausea. Of course, it turns out it doesn't work as well as herbal <laughs> cannabis. So uh, inferior. has its own side effects and, and issues. Um, but, you know, that's why, you know, one of the first pharmaceutical drugs from cannabis got approved yeah. was for that, that yep. indication. Um, and, and people that I've talked to that have um, had parents, family members, friends that have had cancer and have done that kind of thing, that's what they've reported to me has helped the most is being able to use cannabis so they can eat and yep. keep food down yep. and just get a little help from pain. Sometimes, just it's, to sometimes, be able it's, to, sometimes it's significant. Sometimes yeah, it's minimal. Yep. Yeah, just to be able to eat and sleep and not be miserable all mm -hmm. day. That goes a long way towards you know ensuring... Uh, a positive outcome in the long run. And sometimes that's taken for granted. Um, I, yeah. Um, what are a few things that, and maybe we've already touched on this, but what are a few things that you wish people knew? Would you say two or three things that you wish people knew about cannabis before um, considering to engage it in a sort of clinical context? Well, I think the number one thing is that just it's, it's not a cure-all. Yeah, it's not the cure for whatever ails you, you know, um, I think that's that's a really important piece. Um, I think also that I want people to understand that it's not it's not cannabis isn't a isn't a thing. It's not like, oh, you have cannabis on the shelf. Oh, I'll take some cannabis. No, it's it's again, it's back to that that the real complexity and the diversity of, mm -hmm. of molecular, you know, um, the, Ar archetype or yeah, the, the chemo diversity sig signature yeah, you know, the yeah. mole molecular signature of the plant is completely different from one to another and um i'd like them to know that you know it is a plant that it's a plant it's, it's an herbal medicine and i think that it you know back to what this whole conversation started with is that it's it's a part of the botanical medicine toolbox mm -hmm. it's a part of the toolbox of herbs that we use to, to help keep us balanced every day um, those are the main things i wish people would know about it you know i, I think the, the primary one is just that you know, it's not right for everyone. You know, I mean, it's not like cannabis is great for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's just a misconception. And people who, who are really into it think, oh, man, everybody should take this. Right. Like, well, no, I, I don't think there's anything like that. I don't think there's really anything that we should take every day necessarily either. I mm -hmm. you know, like taking breaks from things, you know. One of those things from Chinese medicine is ginseng, right? Panax mm -hmm. ginseng, ren shen, man's root. And that was like a, an incredible boon to be able to take if you're a man after from age 35 on you could take it every day mm -hmm. and the, just the, the energy that it provides to the body the materials that help direct physiology and help to help you stay anabolic mm -hmm. right help you restore and rebuild yourself right. it's you know we prove it out now we see there's all these gensenicides inside there that help actually you know change physiology and will help you probably live a little longer if you do that you mm -hmm. know um, but with cannabis I, I think again i want people to think of it in terms of using it in the sense of what you know what do you what do you want to achieve from it? What do you want it to give you? I'm looking for help with sleep, for example. Yeah. You know, and CBD is readily available, but I don't know that CBD is the right thing for everybody. You know, some people could yeah. really use a, a plant that has more THC in it. You know, people could use a plant that has a different yeah. terpene profile. And so, you know, there's a lot of unknowns out there. I, I think one of the things about plants too that's really fascinating to me is just that you know the the main thing that people come at me with is oh well, there's no data to support. The use of that plant mm. you know there's no data to say that that plant is helpful in a patient with cancer mm -hmm. well okay there's very little data within that efficacy model that we've been talking about yeah why why is there no data it's hard to control no there's no there's no profit 
Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. There's not, there's not a financial motivation to do that work. And I mean, you can't, you can't patent cannabis as it's, as it in its herbal. You can't form. patent ginseng. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. people try, you know, it's like as soon as people have an idea, somebody says, God, I've seen this plant or these, this formula works so well in so many patients for these conditions, man, we got to study it. Mm-hmm. As soon as it goes into that realm of, okay, you need, what do we need now? Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty scary what needs to happen to get a drug. Yeah. It's a, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions, if not into the billions of dollars. Right. Sometimes, you know, a quarter of a million dollars just to do a phase zero trial, just to determine some basic things so you can move into phase An observational one. study. Yeah, yeah. Just really, really simple stuff. Uh, yeah. So it takes hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to make it through uh, the drug approval process, um, in the models that we have now and going back to what you said, and like with the data being available, it's like, well, what do you consider data and how do you evaluate the quality of information? And, you know, something in, uh, the curious about cannabis book that I put in one of the later chapters is the different forms of, uh, clinical data that exist all the way from, um, anecdotal reports all the way to, you know, phase four clinical trials and, you know, that are placebo control, double blind and all of that. And, um, you know, there are varying degrees of quality and types of information you can extract from those different sources of information. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing that I didn't communicate very well that I'm working on in the next edition is that even though anecdotal evidence is up here in like the lower quality realm of uh clinical research and data yeah of evidence that doesn't mean that it has no value or any place or that you can't extract any wisdom from that information it's just you know it it gets into really technical things about how confidently can you make uh, a correlation and causation statements from the data you have and as long as you have a little bit of humility and are a little careful about the um, assumptions that you're making from when you're looking at data, anecdotal reports, case studies, observational studies, those can be super valuable to um, understand what might be going on and everything like that. It's just on a statistical level and on a, on a technical level, you just can't necessarily make uh, causation statements or claims about that. And even these really sophisticated control models, the claims that you can actually make are not as wide as what get marketed from them. And uh, something we were talking about before we started this uh, podcast recording, we were talking about um, resveratrol and research going on with that and how it's, you know, it's hard to take hyper-controlled research that might indicate um, a certain outcome and expand that to true human clinical settings. Right. What do you do with that information? It's it's hard. It it's it still only gives you a broad sense of what might happen in a clinical setting, but really the only causal data that it tells you is that in this circumstance, given these parameters, controlling these variables, this outcome will happen, and that's important. Um, but it's important to understand that that's really all it's telling you. And the wisdom that clinicians gain from how to use uh, uh, medicines broadly ultimately comes from what they see and what they um, experience and what they're um, seeing in broader data sets that are looking at huge populations and showing generalized outcomes and stuff like that, that, you know, those studies that are hyper-focused, they're important, but they have their own limited utility. Um, even though they're very high quality research studies. Um, and so that's just a nuance that, um, I always think of like the, the night sky, like I'm looking up at the sky at night and I'm looking at all the stars up there. Like, wow, there's so many stars. But if I switch my view from positive to negative, I see, whoa, there's a lot of space out there. <laughs> yeah. And I start thinking of like each research study is like a star. You know? Right. Yeah. And we're trying to interpret the sky. Right. And how do we extrapolate from the data coming from one star to the blackness between the stars I can see, which is the mm-hmm. majority of the sky? Right. It's very hard. Yep. You know, and one of the one of the funny little anecdotes that I've heard is that, you know, there's you're walking down the street at night and there's a guy and he's a, he's out there and he's he's under the spotlight and he's looking around on the ground and you're like, Hey, what what are you doing out here? Oh, I'm looking for my keys. Mm-hmm. 
Oh yeah. Oh well, where, where'd you where'd you lose them? Oh, I lost them over there, up the block. Well, why are you looking over here? Well, because the light's good over here, <laughs> right? And yep. I feel like that's part of our. Yeah. You know, we're we're suffering from that same issue. Yeah. And and so back to the beginning of this conversation, which was, you know, why don't we have research? to support the use of botanical medicine in more conditions mm -hmm. because we can't afford it because it doesn't make money because you can't patent a plant and make billions of dollars off of it. I wish everybody in the world just knew that. Mm -hmm. And the same thing's been true of cannabis. We don't have data yeah. with cannabis. We, we're in the dark ages. We don't mm -hmm. know what it doesn't do. We've got a lot of basic sciences research, mm -hmm. but that's not, you don't take basic science research and from the science bench and put it in the clinic. Yeah. How do you apply that? How do you go from the star to the space that we live in? Mm -hmm. You have to use intuition. You've got to use experience. You've got to use textbooks. Mm -hmm. You need traditional medical. You need empiricism of experience over, you know, the long time we've been helping each other through this, mm -hmm. this life, right? Put all that together and then the stars can help to inform us a little bit. But right. this, this reliance on the star is very unfortunate. And I've got a really good friend here at a local oncologist who does, you know, kind of a, a holistic oncology of pr practice as a single oncologist. And she was, she used to be a researcher at Harvard and did a lot of great work on Don Lamont. And she was talking to me about just about how many people who are given oncological therapies, mm -hmm. what percentage of them would actually meet the, the criteria the inclusion mm -hmm. exclusion criteria for the study that was the study that informed the oncological community about what condition, what uh, you know, status of a disease, whether what the stage, what the you know, the place in the body, the tissue of origin was, the age of the patient, all, all that stuff, right? To determine whether that patient who's getting that medication mm -hmm. would actually meet the criteria that's guiding the clinical decision making about what drug they're getting and how much of it right. in combination with other drugs. She said it was 4%. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's way less than I thought you were going to say. <laughs> it was way less than I thought she was going to say. Mm -hmm. I was, I was kind of blown away. And so, yeah, it just, you know, I, I understand the modern science mind mm -hmm. and its desire to know. Right. I do. And I have that drive. I'm a scientist mm -hmm. at heart and I've always been. But what I realized is that there is no objective truth. There is no framework that we're standing on. This is the universe that we're standing on. And we understand that. We don't mm -hmm. know that. We don't know that. You know, we know that there's more space in this room by far than there is yeah. any kind of material or energy, whatever we want to call it, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I resonate with that so strongly on so many levels, just in the analy analytical chemistry world, when I've, um, you know, talked to you about test results, for instance, of things, like, there is no absolute value of what the concentration of this molecule is in this product. We're actually dealing with, like, a cloud of, you know, a range of correct answers, no one is more correct than the other. Um, if you test something repeatedly, you're going to see a spread of variance. Right. Um, the way that um, just chemistry works, you know, these electron clouds, they are clouds, orbital, orbital clouds. They, uh, you know, the more you study science, the more hazy it gets. And you realize that the way we talk about a lot of concepts about science, we use hard terminology, hard facts and everything, because we have to communicate and we have to move forward. Um, but when you get into, you know, the nitty gritty of a lot of this stuff, it is hazy. It's super complicated. It, you can't pinpoint things down to single causes or, you know, hard objective truths that apply, you know, permanently throughout, you know, whatever you're, you're trying to extrapolate it to. Um, so much, so much nuance. Um, that's one of the things that I wish people understood about science broadly is, yeah. and it's, it's tricky because I see it get twisted the other way. Cause you hear somebody say there's no objective truth and then you're like, Oh, well, all this is out the window. There's no truth. And it's like, well, no, that's not exactly what we're saying. Like there are truths, like there are very pragmatic ways to use this information to get real, um, results and predict, outcomes and all this sort of thing but behind all of that there's all of this nuance and all of this haziness um, it's like having a refrigerator you know it's like driving a car an airplane a space shuttle like that's all 
that's all science. We've done these amazing things right. with science. There's obviously something there. It's just that our models are models. They're just they're just models, and so they're only getting right. us so far. And, exactly. and so yeah. we, we we basically get to a point where we're like, well. Based on what we've been able to observe to this point, we're going to agree that this is the structure we're going to work off of. Right. You could call it the Niels Bohr atomic model, right? right. You could call it, you know, Euclidean geometry. Yep. You can, whatever you want to, we, we have these basic, okay, we're going to agree, you know, that this is as close as we're going to get right now to understanding yep. how it works. And then with that as a footing, we stand on that and we move forward and we take mm -hmm. some more steps. But it gets a, the hazy part gets a little scary when you look back and see how many steps that we've made mm -hmm. that weren't the truth, but were the story as we unveil, yeah. uh, unraveled it or unveiled it at that moment. And so it's and it's hard for us to go backwards to fix mm -hmm. the little inborn errors in our you know the things that we accepted as we don't understand. Right. Um, and there's a lot of that, and that was what you know kind of disillusioned me from going down that pure, you know, medical doctor mm -hmm. route, uh, was that I started to feel like there's just so much more that we don't know than what we do know. It's back to the night mm -hmm. sky again. You know, if each star is what we know, the blackness is right. what we don't. And the more you know, the more you learn you don't know. The, the smartest yeah. people I know <laughs> yeah. are very clear that they really don't know much at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yep. And I, yep. I, I feel like as I get older and get more experience, I learn more. I get more and more comfortable with the fact yes. that I really don't know what's yeah. going on here. Yep. Know? Yep. I think that's an important piece of wisdom to, to extract is you, it's a, it's a, it's like a maturation process to get comfortable with that, um, with what you don't know, getting comfortable in the silence, um, you know, uh, that sort of, uh, meditation concept of being comfortable sitting in the nothing and not letting that overwhelm you or, um, you know, just recognizing that that's where we are. And, um, it reminds me of, you know, when you're traveling in a foreign country and you're trying to find something, and this is of course, I'm thinking 20 years ago before mm -hmm. we had, you know, any kind of cellular mapping GPS system or whatever, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. and you're just out there in the world and, and you go to somebody and you're like, Hey, I'm looking for the library. Right. And they're like, they don't really know where it is, but they're like, Oh, oh they really want to help you. Mm hmm yeah. Now, it's really cool to help somebody and to know something. Mm -hmm. So you want to know. So then they, instead of saying, oh, you know, I don't really know where the library is. You know, I think it's in the southeast part of time, but you might want to ask somebody else. Mm -hmm. Nine out of 10 people will say, oh yeah, you go, uh, mm -hmm. you go, go that way, you know, and take a left and you'll, you'll see this place and then it's over there. And then you go driving over there, you walk over there and it's like, yeah, no, you're this like, no. Not, what is this person telling yeah. me? You know? And so it's sort of, I feel like instead of sitting in that place of you, somebody, somebody says to you and says, so, you know, what's cannabis all about? Like, where's, you know, what, what's it, what's its place in medicine? How does it work? How does it fit in the toolbox? Yeah. What is it good for? I mean, honestly, I want to say it's good for a lot of things, but there's a lot I don't know. Mm -hmm. and I want to be able to just say that, you know, yeah. say somebody asks you a question like that you'd love to know the answer to. I don't know. Yeah. And be comfortable with that statement. Right. Yeah. You know, and like, you know, it's so much more um, somehow ingrained culturally in me to want to have the answer. It's in all know? of us. I mean, um, I love, uh, you know, the physicist uh, or really science educator, Richard Feynman. He uh, summarized this really well. Um, he would talk about how one of the things plaguing science education in the United States, particularly because we're in the United States where our culture is especially bad about this is that the public, they want answers and they expect experts to provide answers, not to provide vague statements that seem to beat around the answer. And so the way he described it is that people want answers. They don't want people that get at answers. And unfortunately, what science uh, in a deep way teaches you is that you can only get at answers. It's really difficult to actually get to the hard answer you can you can approach the answer you can get around it you can wrap your head around understanding the problem a lot better and and what's influencing that and everything but finding true hard answers to a lot of problems is um much more difficult and sometimes impossible um but people are really uncomfortable yeah. with that reality and you know this affects politics in a big way because if you can't talk to the public and provide the answer for the path forward, then people ignore you or think that you're incompetent. And some of the smartest people 
are not willing to give hard answers because they understand that complexity. It's kind of the difference and... between the Democratic and Republican approach. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Democrats are like, ah, there's the words and stuff. And I'm just trying to tell you there's so many complex layers and nuances. And the Republicans are like, you know, do this now. Big, bright red letter, you know? And it's like, yeah, I mean, you know, people want it. We want an answer. I think that's one of the most challenging things in my work. And, and one of the reasons why I love it and why it keeps me inspired every day to keep doing it is because there are no answers, you know, in most cases of a person with cancer, it, there, there are many paths forward and mm -hmm. it's not clear. And so the thing that I come back to with most people, because I do just what you're, what you're saying, I say, well, you know, I, I can point at what the answers might be and I can, mm -hmm. I can r help you frame the question right. so that it makes sense to you. And I can describe to you what some of the possible paths might you know, end up providing for you. Mm -hmm. And we can go down those roads and I can give it to you in detail. I can give it to you in your language and I help you understand. But the decision, the choice yeah. is not based on an answer. Mm -hmm. It's based on the start of this conversation. Right. What do you feel? Yeah. Right here. When I said, you know, doxorubicin combined with Taxol for your therapy, you know, that pathway is going to give you this, you know, maybe... Most people, the outcome is they're going to get a reduction of their cancer. We might need to go to another drug at some point. But immediately that moment, you felt this sense of unrest or your, you know, mm -hmm. your solar plexus started to feel like rushy and mm -hmm. you kind of felt anxious. Well, maybe, you know, maybe your body's telling you something there, you know, maybe that's not the way for you. And of course, that's not the only arbiter, but that's right. one piece that I feel like we miss. It's actually like, how do I feel and where do I feel it when I hear those words, when I yeah. see that, hear that suggestion, you know? what's it take to feel that that sense of peace about something because sometimes that that gut feeling of unrest comes from a lack of um understanding, understanding. and so it's like a Fear. lack of comfortability it's like well i don't understand anything about that so i don't want to go into that realm because you know just don't i'm not armed with you know enough information to feel at ease with that and that's where education comes in and, and experience and stuff too and so understanding that piece is like um Sometimes that's what your gut's telling you is that, you know, you need to explore this maybe a little more before making a decision. Right. And, and that uneasiness is telling you you're not ready yet. Yeah. You know, whether whether it is the right path for you or not, that's not known in that moment, but it's telling you that, yeah, it doesn't feel right yeah. right now. And I think that for me, what, what I come back to outside of just, you know, having a mind full of data and research mm -hmm. and, you know, knowing what the drugs do and how they work and what your chances of this and that are is... Look, there's a lot of unpredictability about the future for you in this moment, but there are a lot of things we can choose that can alter the course. Yeah. The most important thing for me in this moment with you is that you understand to the best of your ability what the choices are, yeah, yeah. what it means, and then can you put yourself in the shoes where you've made the choice? You've made the choice from here, and now we're down the road, and we're looking back at that choice. Mm -hmm. Can you say beyond a doubt that you're going to get to that point and no matter what the outcome is mm -hmm. you're not going to regret your choice all right are you committed and and ready to yeah you're not going to regret it yeah. because it could have gone either way you mm -hmm. could have chose radiation and then had cancer that spread and to, or you right. could have chose radiation and you had man an amazing you know cure or you mm -hmm. could have chose you know and you can't look back at that choice and be like oh man i should have and if you can know that in that moment, when you make that choice, it sets a whole bunch of things in motion mm -hmm. that are going to change your outcome, you yeah. know? Yeah, for sure. It's like those little nuancey yeah. things are really, I don't know, that's, that, that's what keeps me juiced about the work that I do. Yeah. You know? Well, I love it. I think that's a, a good way for us to wrap up. And there's, we're going to have to do a follow-up uh, conversation because there's so much that we haven't even had time to get into regarding, you know, like the endocannabinoid system and all the physiological systems that that that's comprised of and connected to and influences. And um, at some point I'd like to talk to you too about um, medicinal plants that um, complement cannabis really well and that sort of thing. Um, so we'll definitely have to follow up and have some more conversations. It's, uh, it's hard to get into all of this with just a couple of hours to work with. <laughs> and, uh, it's, 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 it's fun. It's like, it's, it's exploration with you. I always feel like, you know, when we get into a conversation, 
I just, I feel that there's a really good synergy and my mind just keeps going to new places. And then the way that you bounce off of it, it just, yeah. it creates a really inquisitive and curious. I think that's, you know, curious, curious, curious about it's, cannabis. It's, it's, it's curious minds <laughs> yeah. coming together to talk about it and it all ties together, you know? It's, well, uh, and man, I love Aldous Huxley talked about I love how, um, you know, working through mental exercises is like going on journeys uh, like, you know, geographical explana- exploration and uh-huh. stuff. And one thing he talked about is, you know, um, if you get into uh, an interesting state of consciousness and learn new things about yourself, new insights or whatever, you know, it's like you've gone to Australia and you've seen the kangaroos and then you come back to your home, you know, wherever that is in the UK or United States or whatever, and you maintain that experience and that memory and it's like now you know, oh, those kangaroos, like I haven't just seen them in a book, like I've experienced them, they're there, and you know, you can digest, you know, what that means and how it fits into your worldview. And that's a very simple explanation, but you know, one that, that he gave that I, I liked a lot that, you know, it's how I think about education and um, you know, my before I got into the heart sciences academically, you know, my first degree was in philosophy. Mm-hmm. And um, so that probably shows in the way that, you know, I really like to explore ideas. And, you know, it is like we're traveling. We're, we're, we're going hiking. In World the, traveling, yeah. We're going hiking in these trails of our minds and looking at new things and, and trying to share our our discoveries and see what we learn from them and where we want to go next. And yeah, look over here. I got this rock. Look, you see what I have under here? Right. Yeah. This thing, Turn the know? rock underneath. Oh, there's <laughs> like, stuff oh, did you look at this there. side over here? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and my hope with this podcast is that these kinds of conversations that we're having, I think they're very valuable and they're very valuable for people to um, sit in on and hear. And my hope is that it inspires other conversations to happen outside of the podcast um, for people to, you know, take these ideas in all sorts of directions. And I hope that we can influence that, that evolution of, of ideas, you know, around cannabis. But like I said, again, the springboard concept that, you know, this is really just my Trojan horse into getting people to think about all sorts of other bigger, much bigger concepts. And we've hit so many of them today, but you know, that's, that's my goal. It's like, cannabis is interesting, but the whole world gets a lot more interesting when you start thinking about how this connects to everything else. Um, so anyway, with that, um, thanks so much for carving out the time for us to explore ideas together and go on these journeys and come back home. And, um, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get together again and, uh, and have some more. So thanks Jay. It's really an honor to be here. I really appreciate it and really appreciate your mind. No, thank you. I appreciate yours as well. And, um, yeah, stay in touch. Let me know what's going on um, in your world. I mean, we try to stay in touch as much as we can, but um, you know, I, I know you always have a lot of interesting things going on, just like I try to always have a lot of different things going on, juggling a lot. So keep me up to date. And if there's anything um, that comes up you want to explore more deeply on the podcast, let me know. Yeah, we could definitely okay. do some more, you know, a couple of deep drop ins. You know, yeah. Drop anchor at a couple of places because we're kind of. Yeah, this conversation is high level, yeah, and now we've, we've set the stage to go deeper Love into it. other things. So, yep, cool. All right, well, cheers. Thanks, Jason. Cheers. Yep. Stay curious. <laughs> yeah, stay curious, and I always uh, follow that up with also critical. <laughs> nice. Curious and critical. Yes. Cool. All right, well, thank you guys so much for tuning in and listening or watching. Um, you can learn more about the Curious About Cannabis podcast by going to cacpodcast.com. You can also find us on social media, um, on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. And uh, if you're not listening to this podcast on a podcasting platform, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Just search for Curious About Cannabis and you'll find us. Thanks so much and take it easy. Bye. (laughs)